Good morning. Please listen to these words from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Lord, how great thou art. Will you please stand with us? But God, we come together as a body of Christ to proclaim that you alone are God and you are indeed great. And so are your deeds. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. And may our offerings be a blessing to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Good morning. It's a joy to be in the Lord's house, and uh, it's good to have Doug back, and uh, he had a great vacation, I understand, and it's good to have him back. Uh, we're so glad you've chosen to worship with us this morning. And in fact, I'd like, if you would, just look at the front of your, your bulletin, because I, I, this is a, you'll see our mission statement is right up on the front there. Our mission is leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Our, our heart as a church is that we want to help people grow in this relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to be disciple makers, as, as Christ has called us to. And, and I love all the things that are happening in, in so many places where this is going on. Our, our vision is empowered by Christ. It is only by His hand. And by giving help, hope, and a loving home. And that is our vision of where we're heading. Lots of things happening in our church. Uh, a lot of things of people going out. Uh, I just met Jan. She's with us. She'll be speaking this afternoon. We're so glad you're with us. And we'll be praying for your, your, the outreach this afternoon. If you haven't got a ticket or got lined up, please look into that. Hey, guys, here's an opportunity. And I guarantee the cooking will be good. <laughs> On Tuesday morning, we're having a men's breakfast. It'll be a breakfast for all the guys. Uh, 6.30 sharp. Uh, there's been about, oh, 15, 17 of us sometimes that we gather. We're so excited about it, and we'd love for more men to join us. Uh, 6.30 on Tuesdays, we, we're going through the Book of Mark. We've been at it for a while, and we'll continue to be at it for a while. But we'd love to have you. Uh, I've got my Celebrate Recovery shirt on just to remind you. I love what's happening on Monday nights. The outreach over there uh, in the Challenge Center every Monday night, faithfully. And, you know, uh, it's all about life change, uh, about the recovering the right relationship with Jesus Christ, whatever that hurt, hang up, or habit is. And so please check into that. Uh, a new thing that we put in the bulletin, and we started it this week. Uh, I forgot to let you know that, Leah. A celebration of life services coming up on October 14th. And you'll see that information if you know someone who uh, has, has had a loss of an infant or a child. Uh, this is an important time that we gather, remember them, and we can minister to one another. It's just a very special time, so keep that in mind. I'm going to invite Mel to come on up. Uh, one of the things, being a part of uh, this mission team, I, I'm trying to keep up with Mel to let you know. I really am trying hard to keep up with him. But one of the things I love about the body of Christ here is the outreach. Uh, and Mel has uh, been an outstanding leader and. And every second Sunday, we'll be connecting with one of our uh, mission leaders. So, Mel? Okay. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Uh, actually, uh, it's a work of the whole mission teams. It's just not me, myself. Uh, it wouldn't happen without everybody diligently working to make missions happen here in the church. And that's one of the reasons why I enjoy this church so much is just because of uh, the strong missions emphasis. And so today we're privileged to be Skyping with uh, Randy and Jan Babcock. They're in Fort Collins, Colorado, and their ministry with international students on the college there in Fort Collins, Colorado. And so uh, we just want to welcome Randy and Jan this morning. And we have uh, three questions for them this morning. And the first one is, how did God direct you to get started with college ministry? All right, well, uh, first of all, we just want to thank you. Thank the um, Broken Bow Free Church for your partnership and ministry with us. And um, yeah, just have great memories of all the times we've connected there. Uh, Jan grew up in North Platte and came to know the Lord in high school through Youth for Christ. Uh, my father was from the Anselmo area, and my grandfather and uncle lived there. I grew up um, near O'Neill, Nebraska on a farm. Uh, I came to know the Lord while I was in college, and that was through crew. And Jan and I both attended uh, University of Nebraska at Kearney. And we both have a heart for missions, and that's what drew us together. Uh, before we were married, uh, we both served overseas. While Jan was in college, she served in Europe with uh, Slavic Gospel Association. After I graduated, I um, went to Papua New Guinea and taught at the University of Technology and would visit um, 
uh, Wycliffe translators in the Highlands. Um, we were both called to missions, and um, our mission field is the American University campus. And um, at CSU, we have about 2,000 international students there um, with about 83 different nations represented, most of them from the 1040 window. Uh, so we view ourselves kind of like Philip um, ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. It's like missions in reverse. Um, and when they come here, often they're more open because they're away from their families and their culture and the things that would hold them back from thinking about the gospel. Um, we minister to students who are 18 years old, uh, undergraduates, all the way up to graduate students or researchers who are in their 50s with their teenage kids. Um, so uh, what drew us was our own um, uh, God, Christ changing our heart while we were in that age and then just seeing the potential of reaching these international students while they're here. Okay, and the next question is, is can you share with us one thing that you've seen God doing in the last month within your ministry there in Fort Collins? Uh, probably uh, the one thing has been meeting the new international students. Uh, we have a number of activities to meet them and greet them. We do a stuff giveaway, which is kind of like a garage sale, but it helps meet their felt needs of uh, getting the pots and pans and things they need to set up their home, their apartment. Uh, we had a welcome picnic and then our first um, monthly dinner on Friday. And through this, we've met amazing students. Uh, one is Simon from Indonesia. And he's coming to church with us uh, this morning. We're going to the late service right after this. Um, but a key person on our heart this month would be Yusuku. Yusuku has been here about two years from Japan. And um, he came to many things, uh, Bible study, Sunday school, um, all of our events. And last February, he uh, trusted Christ as Savior. And then his tutor from our English class has been um, discipling him since then and throughout the summer and at our monthly dinner, Yusuku was the one that welcomed all the new students and greeted them, kind of like, uh, like an MC for part of the event. Um, so he's doing well, but he's about to head home to Japan this month. Uh, so pray for him as he heads home that he could continue to walk with the Lord. Pray for his wife. Uh, who's interested, but hasn't made any kind of decision yet. Uh, so pray for them and pray for all the students uh, here to know um, Christ and to grow in him. Okay, thank you for sharing with us, Randy and Jan. And uh, we just uh, want to encourage each one of you to uh, take out your bulletins and write down that name. Would you pronounce that name just once more for us, Yusuf Scott? Yusaku. Yusaku. Okay. So let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Randy and Jan and their ministry with the international students and how they are able to impact uh, students from around the world right there in Fort Collins. And we just pray, especially for Yusaku, that. Uh, you will just uh, help him in uh, being a strong believer and, uh, and a testimony to his wife and that uh, she might come to know Jesus Christ as her personal savior as well. And we ask that you will continue uh, the discipleship of Simon as well as uh, they uh, take him to church weekly that uh, you will just help him to uh, grow in the Lord and be a mighty servant for you as well. And we just thank you so much for their service to you and pray that you will continue to guide and direct their ministry there in Fort Collins. And we ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Well, as we continue our worship this morning, I ask you to stand again with us. And we're going to sing a couple of, uh, well, 
couple of my favorite hymns, I guess. The message is so good. When we trust in Jesus, it's sweet. We trust and obey in our Lord, uh, and he shows us the way to live.
thank you that you are a God that we can trust. You are true to your word. You say you remain faithful in all things because you are God. And God, thank you that you allow us to be part of your work on this earth through the Babcocks, but through the people that we get to meet day to day. And so, Lord, thank you for the giving of material things and that we can be a part of giving back to further your kingdom so we take our offering now lord we pray that our hearts are right before you as cheerful givers and we pray that you would take this offering and multiply it and use it however you want to reach people for jesus and in your name again we pray amen please be seated So grateful for the way that uh, so many of you minister to us, mainly to our God, though, and the giving of music and, and all sorts of things. You know, as I, as I go through life and I get challenged by some pretty tough things sometimes, and I hear from others of you and the things that you have to walk through, I keep going back, and I'm, I think I'm getting a little better at it, going back to the promises of the Word of God. And this, this song um, means a lot to me. It's called Every Promise. Uh, it's not a special. I mean, I, I invite us all to stand and sing to it. But um, the promises of God, where would we be without the promises of God? That's the only way that I can sometimes keep going day to day. And I know that's especially true for so many of you. But will you please stand with us as we sing Every Promise.
Take your Bibles now and turn to today's scripture reading. Today's scripture reading can be found in John chapter 6, verses 12 through 15. Uh, it will be found on page 891 of your small print and 1059 of the large print. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into this world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountains by himself. We'll pray for the message. Dear Lord, uh, I just want to thank you for those that could be here and pray for those who could not and those that are also watching this morning. Uh, just pray for Pastor Tim as he comes to bring the message that uh, you'll speak through him uh, that we can all understand and learn more about you. In your name, amen. Hey, be seated. It's time for Children's Church. Thanks, Bonnie. It's time for uh, kids. Go ahead and enjoy your time. Uh, we're continuing in uh, a series, the Living, Living the Gospel, and uh, we are just edging our way through, and we're in the second part of this, uh, this fourth sign, if you will, the fourth miracle that's listed here. As I've said several times, there are seven signs in John. Uh, this is the fourth one. And, and one of the things, like I shared last week, that's very unique about this particular story, or this, this miracle, is that it's recorded in all four Gospels. It is the one that is recorded in all four Gospels. And and as we were singing, I just was thinking of the words, just these last words, this grace to you, this abundance that has poured out to us. And, and really, this is the picture of this miracle, that it was for all people. It was for all of them. And, you know, I know it's recorded 5,000 people, but we also know that these were men, and most likely that it was more like 15,000 when you include the children and spouses. So this was, you know, I don't think we've ever had a 15,000 gathering in Broken Bow at one meal. You know, I, that, that's a lot of people. I don't know if I've ever attended an event that had 15,000. And, you know, in, if this happened in our time, Dan was showing me this little, little cartoon. I, I wonder how many people would have stood up and said, 
okay, but uh, do you have a, a vegan meal? <laughs> do you have, do you have the, the vegeta vegetarian plate for me? Uh, or, or wait a second, where, where did you get this fish? Were they filled with mercury? <laughs> Could you imagine if that miracle was done today? I wonder what it would sound like. And, and really, that's the bent that, that I, I'm approaching this today with you. Is that, you know, where are these people really at? Or where are they in their hearts? What, what are they really looking for? You know, I, I began, this is the abundance of Christ that is poured out. Just poured out. Like on the front of your bulletin is this abundance of Jesus' compassion and love to people that were starving, hungry. Many of them, that there was a shortage of food. That, that His abundance just came out and poured out to them. In fact, one of the things, like I shared last week, I want to go into it again a little further, is that this is really about Jesus showing them His abundant grace that they would believe in Him. You know, the purpose of John is written for that simple purpose. In fact, if you have your Bibles open to John, flip over to chapter 20, verse 31. You see, the purpose of the whole Gospel was, was summed up in this statement. In John 20, 31. In the ESV it reads this. But these are written, these are written, this sign is written that, <clears throat> that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. This is the purpose of it. This is the whole purpose summed up in this this whole thing right here to all people that they would believe. And if you look at John chapter 6, six if you flip back there, you'll see John 20, 6, 26, reading this way, is that Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, in other words, seeing who I really am, but you're, you're seeking me because uh, you got your fill, because your own personal selfishness, your own personal things. 627, it tells us even further that we are to labor for the food of life that leads to eternal life. That that's the picture of it. 629, that you believe in Him and the One whom he's, who sent Him. 640, believe in Him and that you should have eternal life. That's the picture of it. 644, that the Father draws them to Himself that you could come to Him. See, all this is really summed up in this is that they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the purpose of this miracle. This is the picture of it. You know, last week I shared with you about the soils. We had two pots. And you can see, it's kind of weak. It didn't get a lot of sun. I, I've got to tell you about this, though. Uh, we've had quite a week here at church with this. Uh, actually, we had this in the office because I didn't want to, you know, it's Wednesday night with the Juanas. Didn't want this to get dumped and stuff. And, and actually, this is, this is just soil out of my garden. I, I, I've got a lot of... Uh, stuff in it and, and so I went out and I just dug up a scoop full of it put it in here and then I, I went out actually right out here and just got some dust and gravel and put it in here and if you remember last week I put two bean seeds in it well th this week we had it setting in the office and I, and I came back from lunch and and I walked in and I noticed that there was a the snow shovel and a yardstick laying right in the middle of the room I'm like and Jerry wasn't here, and I'm like, what, what in the world? I come back, and if she gets here, and she tells me, she says, there was a snake in your pot. I'm not going to stick my finger in there and examine this any further, but there was about a six-inch garter snake rolling around in the, and she got this shovel the size, I mean, it looked like a crane. Let's get him, man, let's go. So let's see, this, this whole pot thing's really kind of going, whoa, whoa. But seriously, you notice that the bean's growing. And, and, and you know, I, I just, it's been on my heart a lot over the last few months about people that, that may not have turned their life to Christ. You know, the soil kind of re represents the soul. And the soul is, is the soul ready. You understand, you, we are in a room filled with souls. 
And, and, you know, the soul that is ready to receive. You know, like I shared last week in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, that eternity, the seed of eternity has been put in every human being. But then there's a lot of people that it's dust. Dry. You ever thought about what makes the soil hard like that in a person? What makes a soul hard? There's unforgiveness. There's bitterness. If there's lies that you've grabbed onto, you know, that, that squelches it out. If there's just outright selfishness, of which every one of us have. And if you start focusing on just your own personal things, your own what is this for me, in a moment we'll be diving into this pas- passage, especially verse 15, because you see a whole multitude of people that are looking at Jesus from a political perspective and only that. And their soil is dust. And he's speaking the truth to them that they would come, come to eternity, come to life. You notice that in 1 Peter 1.23 that Peter writes it very clearly. John talked about it all the way through John chapter 3 that you must be born again, born from above. How does that happen? God has placed a seed of eternity from heaven in every one of us. Every one of us. And Peter talks about, if you look with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, you'll see it very, very clearly. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of per- perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, meaning eternal eternal seed from heaven through the living and abiding Word of God. You know, my prayer this morning as we dive into this is that your soil, your soul, is ready to, to receive the Word of God and to receive Him in the abundance that He's come in, in the abundance that He's poured out. See, when the Lord meets His people, it's an abundance that he comes, and the, and the Word of God is like the water. I watered this one at the good soil. With the dust, I, I put no water in it because it can't receive it. Just like a soul who's hard or whatever it may be. We're praying that God opens whatever that hardness is if there's some here today who have not turned and said, Lord Jesus, you, you are Lord. And without you, I'm dead. See, this is the picture. Jesus comes in this abundance to thousands of people with this food. And and, and it's like, this is the picture of who He is. And He comes in grace. I want you to see this. If you notice that plentiful, the Lord gives His grace. He pours it out. In Titus 2.11 and 12, please join me, or I'll be up on the screen. You'll see this picture that He comes in this grace. Here's how He describes it. And when they had eaten their fill. They, he's told his disciples, gather up their leftover fragments. And then this is the tightest passage I was telling you about. Is that for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. It has come to everyone. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. His grace has come out over all people. I, I want you to see this passage again and then in, in, in Matthew Chapter 5, Jesus is speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, and he talks about it, 43 through 48. 43 begins, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's his grace. Go a little further. I think, yeah, there we go. 46. For if you love those who love you, what re- reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Look very carefully at 48. You therefore, 
must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. This isn't about behavior. It isn't about that I've got to act perfect. It's about be perfect in His grace. His grace has come. And it's an abundance of grace that has come out over all. And, and He says, are you, are, you, are you ready to receive this? Or are you locked up in some selfish perspective? See, that there's dangers here as we go further into this text. And, and tying this in with five, there's two dangers in pursuing a life in Christ. I put it in your bulletin. There are two dangers in seeking to please the Lord. The first one is the danger of hostility that can shut people down and push people away. And I don't want to be a part of this. We saw that back in John chapter 5 when Jesus healed the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. You know, that here immediately the, the Jews come and they come after him. Don't be surprised at the hostility that's going to come after you as you want to seek a life in Jesus Christ. Don't be surprised at it. It's going to happen. It's one of the dangers. And many times we see people shrinking back. I would imagine the, the, the couple that we had here on, on, on just reaching out to them and, and praying for them, that as they reach out to people on the university, that many people, as they, they step forward and want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, how the attacks come. I remember at the, in Kearney, we had a Chinese group of kids. One, one particular winter, we had about 25 of them. I remember baptizing one of them just before he had to go back. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. But I remember talking with him about the hostility he's going to meet when he goes back to Beijing. His mother, his father are Buddhists. And they would have absolute, would be abhorred to hear that he had come to Christ. And I remember praying with him before he left that December, about the December 23rd that year, I was praying with him. And he says, would you please pray that I could withstand the hostility that I'm going to face? The second danger is probably a little bit of a surprise, and we see it here in this text, is success. A danger as you see Christ, you know, that success can actually become dangerous. And here's how. The enamored with success, they, they end up getting all kind of in, enticed by it. It's exciting. Enamored is it's filled with this, just the emotion of it, which is fine, but be careful that that doesn't direct the future. How many times we've seen success in ministry and then we start going, okay, next year we have to do it even bigger. And next year we even have to do it bigger then. How easy that's a dangerous slope to get into that we get enamored by it and getting filled with it. And, and then it leads to the second part of this is that we become dependent on himself or our oneself. You know, this enamored, you know, Jesus confronted this and this dependency because in Matthew 10, 16, before sending the 72 out, he says, go out as innocent as doves and wise as serpents. That's Matthew 10, 16. And the reason he described it that way is because, you know, innocent as doves and wise as serpents. Innocent is that, you know, Hosea 7, 11 talks about silly innocence in the grace combined with wise as a serpent. I'm not sure how that snake handled Jerry coming at her with a, with a huge thing. But have you ever cornered a serpent? You know, they, they, you can't corner them. But they're always calculating when it's right for them to move. When you put those two together, that we're to be prudent. Secondly, along that line with that enamored, is that Jesus told us that we're to celebrate one thing, that our name's in the book, and that we stand in the grace. That's Luke 10, 20. You know, this danger of success can come as we get enamored by it and then also then we end up sliding into feeling dependent upon ourselves. If you look at this passage in, in John, the third letter of John, verse 9, it's about Diotrephes. And, and Diotrephes is an individual that he was dependent upon himself not, uh, and, and his own idea of success. I've written something to the church by Diotrephes who likes to put himself first does not acknowledge our authority. In other words, I don't care where you're going, Lord. I'm dependent on what I think and what I believe should happen. This danger of success also leads to become focused on man's wisdom. 
And we know the instruction of the Word is that we are to be absolutely dependent upon Him and absolutely aligned with the Word of God. See, these two dangers can crop into this, and this is what's starting to happen to the Jews here as they're seeing this success, and it's, it's like all these thousands of people here, and, and they're all around there, and they're so excited. But the people wanted to make Jesus a political Messiah because they missed it. They missed it. They were functioning out of Deuteronomy 18.18 18 when, when Moses prophesied that there would be a prophet coming. And they missed it because of their own political aspirations, their own selfishness. They missed the grace. And they missed the whole thing. Many of them did. We don't know how many. See, the people filled with this truth through their own thinking. They support only when Jesus gave them what they wanted. If you look at John, and let me read this again, John six fourteen through 15 When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. Can you imagine this conversation would have been like? It went political pretty fast. It went into all that the Romans were doing to them. It went into all these kinds of things. And and it says, hey, you know, then they started thinking. And then you see John recording Jesus' perception here. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him and force him to make him king. Jesus withdrew again to the mountains by himself. See, they they were moving in a direction that they wanted a political Messiah. They did not want a Messiah to save them. And, and they were so enamored by their, the success of this and all that they've seen. They've, they heard about the healings and they started putting this all together and they go, hey, this is, this is a guy who can turn these Romans around and we can come back to the kingdom of David that everybody said we're supposed to have in the first place. And this is where they started going. I, I hope you're connecting the dots. This is where we stand today. And how quickly that we are fallen in can fall into that mindset that we're looking for a political Messiah, not the one to save my soul and to save other soul and to point other people to the salvation for their soul. See, this is the picture that they're missing. It. We're no different. Have you ever wanted something so badly that you would, you would ignore what the message is and, and then you would, just, you would just get so focused on it and this is what they were doing. They wanted to make him king. They wanted to make him king to rule over the Romans. But you've got to remember how quickly they, they turned. Because it isn't that many days later that it, we see John 19, 15 through 16, that they're yelling, crucify him. Have you noticed something about the political motivation? When it fits their needs, it's all go, isn't it? And then when it doesn't fit their need, they're completely all against. And how quickly they shifted. They missed the grace. They missed it. They were justified based on their own prejudice. They were justifying. Their people wanted to use Jesus to justify their own prejudice or opinion. That's what they were doing in 15. They wanted people to do this. Now let me just clarify something. It's not wrong for them to say that Jesus should be king. Because he will be. He will be king over all. It just wasn't his time. It wasn't his time to do this. And you notice something, this is the picture that Jesus is showing them, is that it wasn't his time to come and be that king. It wasn't wrong for them, but they missed the whole point of who he is and why he came. And what they missed most of all was that he had to die. He had to die to become king. You notice how people have lots of opinions and prejudices and how many times they, they push them. We see it all the way through Scripture. We, we see it from Moses that, that he, he, he had it, you know, he dealt with it with the, the, the Hebrews who wanted to turn back. We, we see it, we, we see Adam even with it. We see Cain with it. We see all these different examples of it. Lots of opinions. But they didn't see Christ in it. And it would be just similar to us at this time. 
I want you to look at Jude 16. It's kind of an ugly verse. Jude is a little book, one letter, one, one chapter, right before Revelation. Because this is a description of this kind of political mindset. I don't have it on the screen. I want you to see this. Actually, I want to start with Jude 14 through 16. Because this is where this leaves them. They, they fail to see who he really is. It was also about this time, this is, this is verse 14, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his own holy ones to execute judgment on all, to convict all ungodly of their deeds and ungodliness, that they may be committed in such an ungodly way in all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. God does not take lightly misusing his, his truth. 16, these are grumblers, malcontents. Following their own sinful desires, they are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. This is what this group was doing. It's ugly. And if we ever fall into this, this is where we miss the glory of who he is and the picture of who he is. You know, that Jesus had to die. This we, find, we know in Mark 10, 45. I'm drilling down to a point that's a little uncomfortable to talk about. You could probably tell by my hesitation in it. Because as I studied this this week, it came to one of the things that this prejudice and this, this uh, political atmosphere that we could fall into. It, it's dicey. And, and how quickly we could fall into it. Because the application that really applies to this and understanding who he is that we're not one of those that will fall into John 6.15. That we're not one of those that we're trying to, to misuse Christ and misuse the gospel for purposes of political reasons or for things of our own selfish desire. It's an awful thing when it's even used in family, when it happens. Let me walk you through the application because it begins here. If we're, if we're going to live a life following Jesus Christ and not abusing that or stepping out of that and falling into the dangers of success or enamored by it, we've got to understand the truth of what it means to follow Christ. Is that we are to say no to anything that lies outside of the will of God. That's hard. And that means it comes down to Galatians 2.20, for example. It's no longer I who live. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, that's a hard walk. That means, you know, that political aspirations outside of this are anything that opposes the will of God. I'm to stay focused on just the will of God and the glory, His glory. Romans chapter 6, you'll see it also, 3 to 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What this really drills down to is this. So how do we know? How do we know when we have said when we have said no to things outside of the will of God? Here's the simple answer to that. We've stopped complaining. We've simply stopped complaining. You know, Cain complained. Moses complained. David complained. The prophets complained. And, and here's the challenge is that I, if I want to live in God's will, is like I have to confront this in my own life. I know a man who uh, spent a lot of his time complaining. He had boys and, and he had them in athletics. And if you've ever been around athletics, there's a lot of complaining that can happen, isn't there? Especially if you're not winning. No one was complaining about yesterday, right? But how easy it is that we fall into this complaining. I know this guy, he had, and, and, he, and every, every time his child would get involved with athletics, you know, he would start complaining about the coach. 
He would start complaining. Man, he, he would, and, and he got really good at it. He was sneaky about it. You know, he'd only talk to his wife about it, and then, of course, his wife would engage in it. And then pretty soon, when you go to the sporting event, you have to hang out with the right people so you continue to complain about it. And then, you know, the, the, he said the only season he didn't complain about it was the year he was the coach. If you haven't figured it out, it's me. It's me. This has been a convicting message. You know, if I, if I am sold out into this, how I, easily I could fall into this group of people that I want to make Jesus something that he's, this is not why he's here. That's not what he's for. You know, I, I hurt my son complaining. And here's how I did that, by, by complaining about the coaches, by complaining about the referees, by complaining and complaining and complaining about those things. You know what I missed with my sons? Coaching them to accountability, to responsibility, to really taking it up what they need to do. You know, okay, so, you know, so you're not starting tonight. Okay, what do you need to improve that you can? Instead of making it the coach's deal, it's about how do I come alongside my son and helping him? You know, and I, I looked at my own life and how many times I fall into the complaining about somebody or about something, derailing the things that God's trying to teach me. See, if I, I, I loved when, when I read this in Martin Lloyd-Jones and in his commentary, in James Montgomery Boyce, and he said, he put it very simply, is that we have a responsibility to stop complaining. And how do you know? How do you know when, when, when you're walking with God and that you're outside of His will? If you're complaining, you're simply this, you're outside of His will. Because you see it in Scripture from whether it's Cain, whether it's Moses, whether it's the people of Israel who are complaining about Moses all the way through. And I don't know about you, but when I come to this passage and I say, I don't want to fall into this 15, verse 15, one of those that's, that's trying to force Jesus into something and miss what he was really here for and what he's he really here for today. And, and I, I pray as you hear that, that you start to see the abundance of, in the abundance of His grace and His mercy and His love that He's poured out to us. When I see other men who have been faithful and how they handled things, I don't know about you and I don't know how much you know about our football coach at UNL, but I was very impressed. No excuses. And you know what? He continued to encourage his men in the midst of this and I, I know a little bit about, you know, just seeing the things about his own personal testimony. That's the kind that I want to be like. And, I, and this is what Jesus is calling us to, that we do not fall into these, these traps. That we do not fall into them at every, any point along the way. Because I don't know about you, but I want to be that person that's growing up with the fruit and the love of Christ that pours out to people and not missing it. You join me in prayer. Father, I, I thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that you guard our hearts from ever making you political, from ever going down a path that misses the truth of the true grace and the love that you poured out to us. Father, I, I just ask for forgiveness of being a complainer that I have uh, taken these things on my own life sometimes and have actually got in the way. Lord, I pray that, that if there's any here that, have, that, that is good to confess and to bring this forth and to lay it open, that we can learn what it means more to live a life crucified with you, that it's no longer I who live, but you who live through us. Lord, I, I pray that you... Uh, your Holy Spirit has spoken to us today. And that your word reaches us, watering our, our souls, that we can come to know more of who you are. 
Lord, I thank you for your abundance of how you've poured it out to us. Your grace has just poured out to us. I ask, Lord, that you guard over the steps now as we leave this body. I pray for the event this afternoon that your grace will just pour through them. And all the ministries going on this week, I pray again that your, your, your word will just go out. We love you, Lord, and Jesus, I pray. Amen. It is good to stand in the will of the Lord, and he will gladly lead us in the way that we ought to go. Please stand with us as we close our service this morning with the hymn, He Leadeth Me. for your promises, Lord, for who you are. You are a God that we can follow. And we do love you. And we do want to follow. So Lord, just thank you for who you are. And as we go and leave this place today, we go out into a mission field. May we be bold in our witness that we would speak exaltingly and worshipfully of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that others would come into the fold while there is still time. God, go before us and help us to live a life that honors you. In your name we pray, amen. You're dismissed.